To welcome back our co-hosts on this beautiful Wednesday morning, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield, two-star. Good morning, Rob. Listen to that opening. I'm reminded of the old adage, do not ask a question unless you know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, he set himself up badly. He on did, that one, didn't he, he did, yeah. Yeah, the, the Badger wasn't going to support that. I knew as soon as he said, Mike Kite will support me, I'm oh, he's not going to support you. Yeah. <laughs> you got to know Mike Kite better than that. And they were office mates there. He they and Hornby here. and yeah. Mike, they all yeah. shared an yeah. office their first year in the Capitol. First, first year, yeah. Also, let's say good morning to Maria Lawrence and All Star. Good morning. Good to be here. How Hi. is the former editor of the journal this morning? I'm doing great. Doing great. Three weeks without rain, though. Again, mm. we're not in a great, great place drought wise, but the weather is so beautiful. Yeah. Gosh, yeah. it's beautiful. And so. Rob, you should modify your introduction, Marie. <laughs> it is the star, I know not you want a that. star. It, she is the star. I just call her All Star. We cannot take anything away from Miss Maria. Well, was, thank you. I appreciate that, Bill. Yeah. A climatologist I heard interviewed the other day, and they had uh, said there was a day last week where there wasn't a cloud in the sky from the Mississippi River over to the eastern That's seaboard right. over That's the right. entire country. Yeah, yeah. Not a single cloud and, in the sky. And they're uh, they're crediting that to the uh, to the Arctic warming. They are the uh, less ice in the Arctic now. So, well, I've been enjoying these seventy degree days. In fact, so much so that uh, I've been encouraging others uh, with internal combustion engines like myself to just keep your car idling twenty four seven. I'm all for this 75 degrees and, uh, and, and modest. I was going to say, so what's, what's the mileage yeah, yeah. Uh, these days no, now? No, don't let him off the hook now. He's he deliberately sticking a knife in my back, <laughs> so, and, I, and I'm trying to squirm to get away from that well, knife. Well, I'm intrigued on whether we're going to make this next benchmark. Oh, I'm, at, uh, I'm knocking on the door of 366 right now. 366. 366. And we're going for 375 or 400? Well, we want to get the fours. Four. We, we want that first digit to start with four. Wow. But look at all the over those three sixty six miles, all the emission that has been put into the atmosphere. I, oh no, Bill! I have a catalytic converter. <laughs> clean yeah. emission. Yeah, clean emission. Right. Clean emission. Our uh, guest in this segment is Tiffany Hoban. She is the director of educational partnerships and strategy with the Cardinal Institute. Tiffany, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, Rob. Good morning to all of you. I hope y'all are doing well. Mm -hmm. I think you could deduce by those introductions that they're in a good mood today. So I, I think they're it's quite should be a pleasant interview, Tiffany. That's fantastic. This this beautiful weather has everyone in a good mood. I'd say, except for Bill, because yeah. no, no, no. He, got, he, <laughs> want, he wants rain showers nonstop around here. Hey, we're getting so dry, can, Rob. Yeah, we're getting so, dry. So he can he can mow a couple more times this season. <laughs> I'll be doing that. I'll be doing it, yep. Tiffany, you did, uh, not you personally, of course, but the Cardinal Institute did a survey of West Virginia parents in regards to education and their impressions and their attitudes toward some specific questions that were asked about them regarding their child's education and the schools in West Virginia. Could you tell us about the genesis of this survey and uh, how many parents actually took part in it? Yeah, absolutely. So this survey was conducted um, for, uh, for about 400 or so, 402 parents, families that have K-12 age students, and they asked them questions about school quality, um, whether they felt their children had like college and career readiness and what the educational outcomes were. They also asked them questions about parental engagement. For example, you know, have you looked into your local school's budget, right, to see what they're spending money on. Do you feel that you're comfortable with those things? And um, the outcomes kind of, there's mainly, main, mainly three highlights from this uh, survey of parents in West Virginia that are kind of key takeaways, I think. Um, the first one is that parental satisfaction overall with their schools. And these parents were, these families had students in all kinds of different K-12 12 settings, um, including public schools. But they're mainly saying that they're not satisfied with the kind of education that their students are getting um, and that they would like to make a different decision. And interestingly, on one of these metrics in the school quality and opportunity um, survey, they also said they feel that they don't have a choice. And uh, the thing with West Virginia is we have all the choices. So that's almost, uh, to me, that's an exciting highlight from this is that even though parents um, generally are dissatisfied with the education that their students are getting. We, as of you know, the last three years, have as many options as, uh, as there are, and 
more than 46 other states in this nation. So to me, that's really great news. We've just got to educate parents on how to access those things um, and make different choices if they so choose. And this was all part of a national survey in which uh, 20,000 parents took part? Yes. Yeah, so each state's um, information was sort of divvied up so that we could examine West Virginia very closely. But yes, the survey was conducted uh, nationwide, and West Virginia's average on the school quality and opportunity as compared to the national average is, is significantly lower. So the satisfaction in West Virginia is much lower than in comparable states? Yes, sir. Uh, does it break it? I saw, I, looking at the study, it, it does break down mm -hmm. in terms of income as well. Were lower income people less satisfied with their public schools or, or school choices that they had, period, end of story, than uh, middle income or upper income? Um, slightly. Uh, it's a marginal difference. Um, these folks that are the low income folks that are saying that they, they felt they have a choice is running about um, 54% and the average runs about 51. So we're looking right at half across the board and in all income levels saying um, that they feel like they do have a choice. So the other half are saying they feel like they don't have a choice. And in regards to the uh, biggest issues that they have with education in West Virginia, summarize what are yeah. some of the biggest issues that they have besides as we know, they have choices now in West Virginia. So what are the bigger yeah. concerns? Yeah, so there's two, kind of two big concerns that came out of that sort of lower level of satisfaction. I think one of them is that's highlighted here is college and career readiness. And so parents are saying um, that they don't, they don't, they lack confidence that their students that are graduating from K-12 schools are uh, workforce ready and that they have um, a adequate college preparation, that they're, that they're confident that their child will be prepared to attend college or are well equipped to succeed in the workforce. And the national average on this is pretty low too. West Virginia came in under the national average on this as well. And so this is kind of like a dismal national average, but it's, it's, West Virginia is not unique here. This is the numbers that are coming back sort of across the country that there's low confidence in these performance indicators of are you prepared when you leave the whole system to go out into the world and do the things that you want to do. And I think in a post-COVID world where questions have been raised across the country about the quality of our schools and um, the metrics that students are meeting for academic performance, um, this, this is a big deal. Uh, the workforce preparation, in my mind specifically, because what we're asking for in workforce preparation, I think is probably um, everyone has an expectation in their mind of what you ought to be able to do to go out into the workforce and to earn a living for yourself and support a family. And we're missing the mark on that across the country and here in West Virginia. And I think it should give people a uh, great concern and pause to think about whether the choices that they do have are some that they ought to look into for their families and their students. And some of the questions, uh, and, and I, I can't tell you this scientifically, but I have, a, <laughs> I have a thought that parents who are more involved actively in their kids' education, do you, do you read to your small child at night? Do you attend the parent-teacher conferences? I, mm -hmm. I, my theory is that the parents who do that more often tend to be more satisfied with the, the preparation of their child because they're actively helping to prepare their child for their future as opposed to the ones who use school as a daycare center. Uh, is there any reflection of that in your survey? I, I see, for instance, that uh, attended parent meetings was one of the survey issues. 24% of low-income parents attended parent meetings, 31% middle income, 27% uh, mm -hmm. I was a West Virginia average, 25% is the national average, so West Virginia actually outdid the national average on that one. But did that correlate at all to you in terms of satisfaction? I think so. I, you know, that entire section that you're referencing there, right, so where we're saying they attended parent meetings, it, it does rate, rate a little bit above the national average. But to me, that says that parents are going places where they're wanted, right? They're, they're going to the PTA and the PTO meeting and We've all seen in the last year, you know, um, videos on YouTube and, and on social media about parents going to school board meetings, and that can be contentious at times. And I think, to your point, 
parents that are more involved are definitely going to have higher satisfaction levels because they're paying attention, they're asking questions, they're going to the meetings and they know what's happening. But I think that there's also areas where even parents who are engaged, even parents who want to know what's happening with their students are meeting obstacles. Um, academic transparency is very lacking. That's what the tension in those school board meetings often reflects, that parents want to know what's happening inside their schools and inside their classrooms, and they're not being given access to that, so they don't know what's being taught. Um, and even in an earnest way, right, like I just want to know what my kid is learning so that I can support he or she at home. I want to help with the books. I want to help with the phonics instruction. I want to help with the multiplication tables, and I can't support the work that's happening in the school building if I don't know what that work is. And sometimes it's a gotcha, right? Like I want to know what you're teaching because I want to make sure it's okay. But oftentimes it's just I want to help as a parent. I want to be involved in what's happening here. And oftentimes the schools um, blockade that for a variety of reasons and, and don't let parents in in that way. And the second piece of that information and engagement section has to do with school budget familiarity. And, you know, parents are taxpayers too, and they're wondering how the money is being spent, and they, do, they don't really have access to that. I mean, they do. There is a website they can go to to kind of track down what money is being spent where, but they're sort of big bucket, high level view of where the dollars go. And it's not a breakdown that a lay person could understand. I, I want to go to the district website of whatever county I'm in and click on a button that says budget and find the items and be able to read them with some kind of um, clarity and understand how those dollars are being spent. And across the country, we just see that Families don't even know where to begin on that. And so they have the confidence is eroding because parents don't have the information that they want, even when they're attempting to be engaged. Bill Stubblefield. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Tiffany. Uh, question. This is all, this is strictly directed toward public schools. Is that correct? It does not include charter schools, or alternative schools? Yeah, there were, there were, it was all types of different schools, families in types, different types of schools that were surveyed here. It was about, it ran about 75% public schools, but there were some other families in there as well. How did you, uh, did you break down the reaction of public schools of, uh, in, as, in contrast to charter schools? No, sir. It was not split out for this study. So everything is viewed as, as a single unit in that, in that regard. Okay. Yeah, just family, just family, families yeah. who have students that are run the age between kindergarten and 12th grade. Okay, and I was struck by the fact that uh, uh, 28 percent felt their children, their kids were prepared for college, but also mm -hmm. tr uh, a comparable number equipped to succeed in the workforce. Uh, yes, sir. Th so both going to college and the workforce get the same low percentage. Is any uh, mm -hmm. thought given of why those identical scores? I would have thought the workforce would have been higher than the uh, than college. I would think so, too, and, and I think it's just, I think this is a, the college and career readiness is a reflection of um, a parent, the parent's inability to engage with the schools and understand what's happening, and just that it's all downstream of this sort of sense of general dissatisfaction, and, you know, I think uh, this might interest you, Bill, because there's, you know, there's other metrics that you could use about, like, workforce preparation. We know that with military entry right now, students are having a hard time passing the ASVAB, right, the military entrance exam, um, which is what they use to place you for work when you, when you join the military. And a lot of our, our students are graduating from high school, and they're not even equipped to get a high enough score on the ASVAB to enter our military. And there, there are lots of metrics that we could use for what workforce preparation looks like, but I think we can agree that basic reading, writing, and math skills are going to be used in nearly every um, sector of the workforce. And so parents are thinking about where their kids are right now and what their future looks like, and, you know, they're not happy with it. 
Yeah, and I and I agree. Uh, reading and writing the, the the math is very critical. Mm -hmm. uh, but going back to the uh, the parents themselves out in the survey, was there any correlation given between the uh, the parents' reaction or feel their children were not being well prepared, and the parents' in personal engagement with the school system? There's there's not. Those two categories in the survey are not linked together necessarily. But shouldn't um, but they be? As Rob, yeah. They should. Yeah. Uh, well, I I think okay. I think what like to Rob's point earlier, what he was saying is there there's going to be a correlation between the amount of engagement that parents have and this the outcome that their students get. Right. If I'm mm -hmm. a mom that reads with my child every night and practices, you know, multiplication tables and does all the things in the evening, of course the outcomes for my student are going to be far better. But there's also um, and, and Rob, said, Rob referenced, like, parents who have it as a, a babysitting situation, right? Like, we just – but some parents are just in situations where mom, mom drops student off in the morning and goes to work all day, right? And dad's working at night, and these – the, the parents aren't in a position necessarily to provide those kinds of supports. And there's a basic level of proficiency that we expect the public school system to provide – that should prepare students minimally to be prepared to go into the workforce. We can agree on that. Student, regardless of parent engagement. Yeah, we can agree on that. I think that's a fair yeah. information. Yeah. Again, mm -hmm. you use the term public school system that comes back, to, harkens back to my first question. Uh, but this yeah. does, this includes the, all the education system, both public yeah. as well as charter. So, yeah. Yeah, it's about 75% yeah. yeah. public. But, yes, it's a mixture. Yeah. Well, okay. and again, charter schools Correct. are public schools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and okay. charter schools are they not are, private absolutely. schools. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Tiffany, yeah. talk a little bit. You said there were three um, three parts to this, and the first part being that parents are generally not satisfied. What are the other two for our listeners? Yeah, I think I think we've kind of covered them, Maria. Okay. Like the first one, the first big one was school satisfaction, and okay. then the second major category for me was information and engagement. Okay. Which we talked about, like parents sort of having access and being in a relationship with the school and a relationship with the teachers. And then the third part was that college and career readiness gotcha. that we've been talking about as well. Yeah. So, but it, I think you know. The, oh, so go ahead. I'm sorry. Maria. No, I was just gonna make a comment. Um, I think it's fairly well known that. Um, when you're looking at those engaged parents, not painting with a broad brush, but sort of painting with a broad mm -hmm. brush, as the child gets older, um, either the opportunities become um, fewer. I mean, your kids are involved in all kinds of different things and you can do that. But in terms of a PTO or PTA, you know, once they get past like middle school, um, those mm -hmm. kinds of things, there's not as much opportunity. Um, but again, the kids are, uh, some kids are involved in a, in a lot of other things that, that the parent mm -hmm. can be involved in. Just a little side note. Um, I went, I was in a school, um, this week, third grade, um, at one of our local, uh, public schools and <laughs> the children were very engaged, very excited. The teacher was enthusiastic. Um, I don't think it was a one-off. Um, I felt really good leaving that classroom um, when I left. Now, are their parents engaged? I asked, what was the definition of community? And kids raised their hands. And, you know, for third grade, I thought that was pretty good. So, um, again, it, it, it just depends on where you are and what you see, I think. There's an interesting survey question here that uh, – reads, would you make the same choice? Percentage answering that they would send their child to the school they go to today if you had to do it over again. Yeah. The national average on that is 64%. The West Virginia average is 52%. Mm -hmm. That's significantly lower than the national average. That's concerning. Yeah. That, that should be concerning I, to all of us. I think it is concerning, and that's, that's why, you know, the, the, to me the main key takeaway, the first thing that we talked about is, we have open enrollment in this state. Parents can choose to go to if public schools, what you have to do or what you want to do. I mean, I, for, for me and for Cardinal, like we're, we're agnostic about the choice that parents make. Mm -hmm. I don't, 
I don't care what you choose for your family. If you should choose whatever you think is best for you. And if that's um, the school that Maria went to and the teachers are delightful and everybody's happy and healthy and learning, then that's the choice that you should make. But there are other options and you can choose another public school. You can choose a charter school in this state. You can choose to homeschool. Um, you can do what I do with my son and um, my son is on the Hope Scholarship, and we completely unbundle our education. I didn't buy curriculum to teach him at home because I have a full-time job, but he's got teachers. He meets online with different groups. So there's just lots of different ways to do this, and it can look different for every family. And I think I would say um, to the people of West Virginia, if you would not make the same choice, um, ask yourself why and investigate to what your options might be and what an alternative could look like for you because 50% is kind of dismal. That's half the people, half the parents that were surveyed said, I would like to do something different. Uh, Tiffany, what's the end, uh, what's the goal of this? Are you going to use this information to carry state board of education, the, the legislators for educational purposes? What's your intent for using this survey? which I think is a very important, significant survey. I think the intention here is just to have, have some level of understanding. Like parents are saying, we want better. We want choices. We want to be let in, right? We want to have a relationship with our school. We want to have a relationship with teachers. We want some transparency around what's happening. We would like to know how our tax dollars are being spent. And I think this is just a way to start a conversation that um, families are not um, confident right now and they're struggling to be okay with what they have and that should give everyone in the legislature at the BOE all pause and say, the people that we are serving are dissatisfied. What do we need to do to improve that? Fair enough. Okay. Good stuff. Hey, uh, real quick, uh, Tiffany, is there, is, in terms of the breakdown of this information, is there a comparison of rural states to rural states anywhere in this survey? I didn't detect that myself. There is not in this one that you probably that you have in front of you because it's West Virginia, but at, at the main website for 50 can, you can go on and look at all the national statistics and, and, and look at different states and compare them to each other. Great. That, that's wonderful because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have a choice with open enrollment. If you live in a populated area where the next school is a half a mile down the road or a mile down sure. the road, but if you're out in the middle of nowhere and the next school is 50 miles away, you, Mm. You effectively really don't have a choice. You have to attend the one that's yeah. attainable, accessible. Anyway, right. Tif Tiffany, thanks. I appreciate your time this morning. Where can we go to read all the survey results online? Right. CardinalInstitute.com has West Virginia's um, uh, results, and I'm there as well. My email, and people can reach out and ask questions, and I'd love to keep the conversation going. Thank you. I think this is the first time we've had you on the show, correct? Yes, sir. All right. Well, you did yeah. great. It was marvelous having <laughs> yes. you. Thanks, Thank Stephanie. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks, you guys. Have a great day. Bye -bye. You Tiffany too. Tiffany Hoban from the Cardinal Institute at uh, 